Geez, Lily, you look like a walking corpse. Thanks, Greg, I say. Jamal smacks Greg. I don't really blame Greg for thinking so, though, because I certainly feel like one. Probably because I didn't get any sleep last night, or the night before. In fact, the past three nights have been about waiting for the thing in my closet to come out and kill me. It's hard to close your eyes when there's something in your closet that might want to kill you. Saturday, I spent outside in the front yard drawing in the dirt with a stick. Fun, I know. I'd go around back and play in the woods, but my dad has some secret project he's working on in the backyard and told me I'm not allowed to go back there until it's done. I'm not even allowed to look out the windows to peek. He says if I see it, he'll just stop working on it. And I mean it. He really does mean it. He's not like one of those dads who says he's going to do something if you don't do what you're told and then you don't do what you're told and he just talks his way around doing the thing he said he was going to do. I know kids who have dads like that. They're all spoiled. Probably because they know that even if they do the thing they're not supposed to, they won't get in real trouble for it. <coughs> Lisa Welch. On the other hand, maybe the thing Dad is doing in the backyard isn't something I want him to do. In which case, seeing what it is and causing him to stop it could be a good thing? I don't know. He's probably building me a treehouse, judging from all the lumber he's been going out and buying. Even Pasher won't tell me what it is. I never thought Pasher would conspire with my dad. Sunday, I stared at a book and pretended to read it for a couple hours. I think I completely fooled Mom. Normally, I'd spend Sunday in my room doing a still life at my art table, but there's a thing in my closet that I think wants to kill me, so I stay out of my bedroom except at bedtime. Then I sit in bed until I hear Mom and Dad go to sleep, at which point Pasher and I hurry down to the living room and try to sleep on the couch. Except I can't sleep because I feel like even from there, the thing in my closet is reaching into my brain with long, invisible tentacles and trying to get into my nightmares. And I have to think about brick walls and oceans and the names of every pet I've ever had until the sun comes up. The worst part of all this is I think I ate a grapefruit this morning by accident. My dad put something in a bowl on my placemat at breakfast, and I remember scooping it and it tasting sour, but I was in such a haze of sleep deprivation that I just ate it without thinking or looking. Dad even asked me, You don't want any sugar on that, hun? And I just said, Yes, and finished it and then gathered my backpack and lunch and walked out to the bus stop. Can you die if you don't sleep? I asked Jamal. Jamal shrugs. Maybe. Greg sticks his orange head up over the seat and blinks at me several times. I saw a Star Trek episode where they went crazy from lack of sleep. Okay, well, you can't dispute the science of Star Trek. I'm gonna lose my mind, I guess. I look out the window and I think I see a big black dog wearing a funny hat driving a little red car alongside the bus. It looks at me and cocks its head like dogs do. I blink a couple times and there's not even a car there anymore. This must be it. The beginning of my descent into madness. Lily Madness. At school, I stand at my locker and mess up the combination three times. The bell rings for people to be in class, and I'm still trying to get my locker open. Right 13, left past 13 to 42, then all the way around to 6. How am I screwing this up? P.S. Please don't memorize my combination. Finally, I get it and look around only to realize the hall is empty. Everyone's in class, and I'm just starting to put my backpack away and get the right book out. <sighs> I'm even blanking on the name of my homeroom teacher or where to go. I'm just so tired. I close my eyes for a second, kind of like blinking, only I don't follow through on the second part where you open your eyelids again. And the next thing I know, I'm tipping forward and banging my head against my locker. Maybe I'll just go see the nurse and ask to lie down. The nurse's office smells like formaldehyde. That's a liquid they use for preserving bodies. I smelled it at my brother Roger's wake. They had him laying in a coffin, dressed up in a suit he'd never wear when he was alive. I want to say he wouldn't be caught dead in it, but he was dead, and we caught him in it. When I went to say goodbye to him, he smelled like pickles. I thought that was really weird, like maybe the funeral home people had had pickles with their lunch and accidentally spilled some on Roger, but Pasher said I was just smelling the formaldehyde. Nurse Halifax is restocking some of her medical supplies when I come in. 
She looks like she's 30 years old going on 100. Her hair stock white, which I think means you should be shocked to hear her real age after noticing her white hair. Honestly, she's got a baby face like some of the college kids I see sometimes at the mall, but I guess she's been alive a long time because my dad remembers her being the nurse when he went to school here. She squints at me. What are you doing here, Lillian? I felt really dizzy, so I was hoping I could lay down for a bit. Do I need to call your parents and have them come pick you up? She asks. Oh, please, no. No, I just need to rest a moment if that's okay. She checks my temperature with the back of her hand, which I don't really think is the most effective method. It's not like I'm trying to weasel my way out of school. I just need a nap. Besides, after homeroom, we have English, and I already know English good. All right, you can go lie down in room two. She waves me off and goes back to reorganizing her tongue depressors. The nurse's office has three rooms for kids to lie down in if they're sick, each with one of those padded tables like a doctor's office. I go into room two, shutting the door behind me and turning off the light. Ah, <sighs> blissful darkness. It's not pitch black, though, because of a single watt bulb over the sink. I'll leave that on for a bit of comfort. I can hear it humming as I lie down on the padded table and take a look around the room before closing my eyes. There's a chart on the wall with a detailed drawing of all the muscles and bones in the human body. It stares at me with its cartoon eyes, so I roll over to face the wall and go to sleep. I dream about standing at the top of a hill in my backyard, looking out into the woods. There are people standing among the trees, and they're all looking at me. I can't make out their faces, but I can feel their eyes on me. One of them raises their arm and points at me with a weird, gnarled finger like some witch out of a bad movie. A big black dog appears at the person's feet, flaps its mouth like it's barking, but no noise comes out and then starts dashing up the hill toward me. The sound of a door creaking wakes me up. How long was I out? I can't tell. There's no clock in the room. I sit up and look to the door, expecting to see Nurse Halifax checking in on me, probably to tell me it's time to go back to class. The door is closed. The other door, however, is opening. You know, the door that wasn't there before... It's set in the wall at the end of the padded table, and I swear I've been in one of these rooms before and there was no other door in it. It would have to open into the next room, but instead it opens into utter darkness. There's a poster hanging on the other side of the door, and I recognize it because it's my Beatles yellow submarine poster that I hung up in my closet. Why is my bedroom closet following me to school? Are you fudging kidding me? I mutter. As if in response, a thin woman steps out, walking with a strange limp, one leg thumping heavily on the floor. Her skin is so pale it almost glows. People tell me I'm pasty white, but this lady could almost be made out of paste from the way her skin looks. She's wearing tattered brown pants that are held up with an old piece of rope, and her shirt seems like it's made of mummy wrappings. Her hair is almost as white as Nurse Halifax's. Maybe she's her secret albino daughter that she keeps locked up. In my closet. That shouldn't actually be here. The pasty lady turns her head like it's locked into place on her neck and looks at me with big, bulging eyes. Her nose is pinched and almost flat on her face, and her mouth is thin and crooked. She says one word at me. Lily. And then she grins, and all her teeth look like little cat fangs. It's like her head was once a jack-o'-lantern until somebody made her into a real girl. I don't say anything back because, frankly, I'm hoping I'm still dreaming and I just need to wake back up. And also because don't talk to strangers. What is wrong with you? Why do all these creepy people just show up and have to ruin my day constantly? Do you know who I am? She asks. Her voice is soft. Not like a whisper, more like that of someone you'd meet at the park who's trying to convince you to get in their van because there's a puppy in the back, but your parents are just five feet away. You're the boogeyman, I say without thinking, though I have no idea who she is. Her eyes roll back in her head for a moment, peering back around the other side. That's a good name, 
We've heard it before, my sister and I. I look at the door to the main section of Nurse Halifax's office. The boogie woman stands between me and it, just off to the side but close enough that she could easily grab me if I made a dash for it. The hair on my arms is prickling me and there's a sharp ringing starting in my left ear. I'm afraid to look back at her, to make contact with those weird bulging eyes and their tiny pupils. She reminds me of a shark, like a person had a baby with a shark. I don't know if the shark had the baby or the person had the baby. Maybe the person was swimming with sharks and kissed one without thinking about it. I'm not stupid. I know how babies are made. I prefer the name Onakoli, she says. She gestures back toward the darkness beyond the door she came through. I'm here to bring you to meet my mother. I shake my head. I'm not going in that closet with you. I turn toward the other door and shout as loudly as I can, Nurse Halifax, help! She can't hear you, the boogie woman says with a smirk. She runs her tongue over her little cat fang teeth. At the moment, she doesn't even remember you're here. I try to focus, to visualize the future the way Pasher taught me, to try to get some hint of how to proceed, but all I see is darkness. It's not my first time I haven't been able to see the future while I've tried to will it. Stupid gift likes to make my life difficult. Ten bucks says I wouldn't even be sitting here on this paddled table about to get eaten by a shark-human hybrid boogie woman in the nurse's office if I couldn't see things before they happen. The boogie woman holds her hand out to me. I know you have no idea what's going on, but I'm not here to take you to Hades or anything. Although, if you'd rather... My sister can come for you instead. She's been known to eat a child or two. I took my hand in my pockets. Why are there only two options? She shakes her head with amusement. I hate it when creepy people are amused. Last chance, little one. Come with me. Meet my mother. Or we'll send Lamia. Maybe she'll just bite off a finger or a hand when you fight. Do you want to see what she looks like? My sister, I can show you. Her face starts to melt, slowly at first, but quickening like someone held a blowtorch to a clay sculpture. Her body bends like it's made of taffy, stretching her mummy bandages. They don't rip or come apart at all, it's more like they're part of her body. Ugh. I want to scream as I watch every recognizable feature of her warp and twist puddling in on itself. For a second, I see a beautiful face, prettier than the one she had before she started morphing. It turns and looks at me with hollow eye sockets and opens a mouth with several rows of teeth. Remember earlier when I said she looked like a shark and a person had a baby? Well, I was wrong. Now she looks like a shark and a person had a baby. Is this what you want? The thing hisses. It's got at least three elbows on each arm and four arms sprouting out of it. I can't even tell where its legs are. It's more like a giant stalk. Like it's growing out of the floor rather than standing on it. Can we have a do-over? I yell, covering my eyes. There's a sound like somebody slapping a wet towel around and smacking people with it. My brother Roger used to do that whenever we went swimming. He'd get the towel soaking wet and then snap me with it. A wet towel really hurts when you get snapped with it. I heard someone once lost an eye from getting snapped with a wet towel right in the face. Mom and Dad always told Roger not to snap me with his towel, so he just waited until they weren't looking so he could do it. I wonder where Roger is right now. When I look again, she's turned back into the gaunt, pale woman she was before, although her white hair is now a bit blonder and longer, and one of her eyes is a little off-center. It's kind of distracting, but I don't mention it because I don't want her to feel self-conscious. Shall we go? She asks. Look, I don't want to get eaten by your sister, but I can't go right now. I've got school. English class is looking so good right now. I wonder what Simone is doing. She's probably sitting in class wondering what I'm doing. The boogie woman shakes her head. Time works differently where we are going. Well, isn't that wildly convenient? Where exactly are we going? I ask, pointing at the door. Just right in there in the closet? We are going to the crossroads where my mother lives. Your mother lives at a crossroad? 
The boogie woman nods and grabs me by the hand, pulling me off the padded table. Her grip feels cold and clammy, like I'm being tugged at by a fish. I stumble to my feet. I'll explain on the way. I don't want to go, but I feel strangely compelled to let her lead me into the darkness of my closet. My closet. In the nurse's office. This doesn't make any sense. I'm dreaming. Lily, wake up. The door slams shut behind us. At the same time, the inside of the closet is lit by fire. I panic for a moment before realizing we're not actually standing in a little closet, but in a stony hallway with rough-looking sides. There are little bowls nailed into the rock walls, and each one has a little bonfire inside of it that starts to light up the whole place. The hallway goes on seemingly forever, and the flickering fires make me feel dizzy again. But not like banged my head against my locker dizzy. More like I'm losing a sense of which way is up kind of dizzy. The boogie woman holds my wrist with her fish-cold hand and walks awkwardly down the passage, one foot thumping hard across the floor with every other step. As we go, she starts talking like a tour guide. We call it the crossroad. Think of it this way. Your existence is like that door we just went through. You live on one side of the door. I run my hand along the stone wall. It feels wet and slimy, and I'd swear it just twitched when I touched it. Maybe this isn't stone at all. Oh god, please don't be inside a living thing. When you die, it's like walking through the door to the other side. You mean like the veil to the afterlife? I ask. She turns and looks at me, still clopping along. Actually, I take that back. Her head doesn't turn, but her eye moves around the side of her head to look back at me. I gag a little, watching it swim around her in her skin. Yes. The veil. The crossroad is the veil. She says. What do you mean? Actually, I have more important questions like, geez, does this hallway ever end? How long are we going to be walking here? When you said time works differently, did you mean that we'd be walking down this creepy, fleshy hallway forever? Also, am I going to die? When you walk through a door, you're passing through a plane. I don't know how we got on the subject of airplanes, but okay. That plane is like another form of existence. We live on that plane. And my mother lives where your plane and our plane meet. At the crossroad. At the Vale. You live on a plane? I can't even imagine trying to live on a plane. You'd just be flying everywhere constantly. I wonder if they have their own stewardesses. Maybe that's who this lady is. Her and her sister might be stewardesses. Does that mean her mother is the pilot? We're almost there. I look past her at the endless hall and the flickering fires and the wet-looking walls. I don't see any other end to it. Maybe not having both eyes looking forward is confusing her vision. But a moment later she goes, Ah, here we are at last, and reaches out into the emptiness, twisting her wrist as if she's turning a knob. The hallway moves like it's a painting on a wall and opens away from us into a deep purple glow. Pretty. The room we step into looks like one of my dreams after I had pizza for dinner. You ever have pizza for dinner and then have really weird dreams? Maybe they just drugged my pizza or something. Anyway, the purple glow comes from these shiny crystal rocks that are glued onto the ends of metal poles standing around the room. There's no corners in here, it's just one big circle. Or rather a cylinder, I guess. It's like we're in a big soup can. I mean a really big soup can, like a house-sized soup can. This doesn't look like an airplane, I mutter. The boogie woman lets go of my wrist finally and thumps away from me on her big heavy leg. She walks over to one of the walls, bends down and makes a motion like she's unzipping the side of a camping tent. I went camping one summer when we were visiting my Uncle George's cabin before he had finished getting an addition built onto it. Roger and my cousin Susie got to sleep on the porch, and I got put out in a little pup tent in the front yard. 
Roger and Susie tormented me all night by making werewolf noises from the porch until our parents came out and told them to shut up. The wall unzips just like my pup tent did, revealing an arch into another hallway. Follow me, the boogie woman says, looking back at me with her cat fang grin. Mother is waiting. Lily, you are not in Kansas anymore. I am in so much trouble right now. I don't even know where to begin. I wonder if Nurse Halifax has checked on me yet and found the room empty. Or what if what the boogie woman said is true and that she's forgotten entirely that I was even there? Or if time is frozen while I'm in here, wherever I am. What if I get back and find that a hundred years have passed? What if I don't get back? Oh, Pasher, will you wonder whatever happened to me? Can you even sense that I'm here? I follow the lady down another hallway, this one made of actual stones, not weird, fleshy, stone-looking material. It's like someone actually built this hallway rather than carved a tunnel through a meat mine. Ugh. There are other doors in the walls, no two seem to match. I wonder if this is how the boogeyman or boogie woman gets into people's bedrooms? I wonder if one of these doors leads to Lisa Welch's room. <laughs> Maybe I can talk them into eating her. We zig and zag down hallway after hallway of doors. I'm honestly lost at this point. Not that I wasn't lost before. I mean, I'm not sure I could get back home on my own even if I tried. The boogie woman doesn't seem worried that I might run away. <sighs> I imagine things work differently here than back home. Finally, we enter another large, round room. This one's even bigger than the last one, and it's got other people in it. There are huge pillars sticking up floor to ceiling, and stone chairs that seem like they grew right out of the floor. The other people sit and look at me, their eyes shining like cat eyes. A huge chandelier hangs from the ceiling in the center of the room and has at least a hundred candles in it. I wonder, who has to light all those candles? I do not want that job. In the middle of the room is a big stone chair, and there's a lady sitting on it, raven-haired with shiny eyes like the rest. She's got on a long white dress, and the big black dog that was following me on Friday sits by her side while she pets it. Everyone except the lady on the big chair stands when the boogie woman and I enter the room. There's a murmur through the lot of them, but I can't understand what they're saying. I think it's another language. Oh boy, if we're not speaking English here, I'm in trouble. Welcome, Lillian, the raven-haired woman says. It's in English. Whew. She doesn't sound like she means it, though. Welcome, that is. If anything, her tone sounds like she actually means the opposite. What's the opposite of welcome? Like, what do you say to greet someone who you don't want to be there? Hi, I stutter. The people around me sit back down with a rustle. The boogie woman walks over to stand on the other side of the woman's chair. Can I pet your dog? I ask. You may not. She pets it herself. Oh. The woman stares at me. She doesn't blink. I don't blink back, but I don't feel comfortable staring at her, so I stare at the dog instead. The dog stares back at me, too. Damn it! I stare off into space. Space can't stare back at me. My name is Hecate, Lillian. Do you know me? Hecka what? Hecate? No, I admit. Well, I know you. Oh. At this point, I feel like I'm known by way too many of the wrong people. It would be nice to have maybe someone cool, like that kid from the Goonies, know me. The one with asthma? Not some woman who sits in a big, empty room doing nothing, surrounded by people doing nothing, all doing nothing in a big, empty room together in the middle of a maze of hallways with doors to people's closets. You are the knife that cuts the veil. She says. Her words ring in my ears because I've heard them in that order before. Officer Flowers called me that. The knife that cuts the veil. I didn't understand it then, and I'm still confused by it now. I don't know what that means, I tell her. 
It means, the woman says, standing up and taking her hand off the big black dog, that one of us is going to have to destroy the other. Hey there kids, it's me, Mr. Creepypasta, and thank you for watching tonight's video. I want to talk to you about one quick thing uh, before we get into the real outro here. Uh, and that's going to be the Australian fires that are currently taking place. Uh, I'm pretty sure everybody has seen on their social media or on the news or what have you about what's taking place in Australia right now. The fires are raging out of control. There's something like 1.5 million acres that are currently on fire. It's pushing animals towards extinction, forcing people out of their homes. Many of them YouTubers and other uh, creepypasta narrators um, that you probably listen to here. Um, but one thing that actually kind of gets to me is that there's... There's a lot of awareness about what's taking place down there. There's a lot of photos and videos I'm pretty sure that you've all seen, but nobody's really talking about where you can go to to be able to donate, uh, to be able to help um, either firefighters or relief funds or anything like that. And that's what I want to try to bring to you guys, or at least have you guys try to share around even if you're not able to donate. If you look in the description down below, there's four different links there uh, that I'm going to have on the videos for the next couple of weeks. Um, and hopefully we can, and we, I mean... <laughs> All of you uh, can be able to um, share this around and all of us together can be able to actually get some more eyes on where we can be able to go to help. I mean, yeah, we're a group of people that like horror stories, horror movies, horror what have you. But um, I think one thing we can do that's at least powerful for us is we have the ability to minimize the amount of horror in real life. Uh, so, thank you guys so much for watching or listening. If you're listening to this on the podcast, available on Spotify and on Apple and on SoundCloud and on Google or wherever you get your podcasts from. Or if you're listening on the podcast, then thank you for watching on YouTube and subscribing to Mr. Creepypasta. And a very big thank you to my patrons from patreon.com slash Mr. Creepypasta, such as Dr. Strawberry, Jordan Alexander Sanchez, Chumpinski. Brianna Ventine Jensen, Stephanie Van Huss, Tristan Pelton, G Weevil 3, Diane Krauss, Asia, the Red Oak Shield Virus, Sandy Barney, Nico Kyle, Caleb Dugall, Daniel Polson, Dante Rao, The Last Blade Song, The Ginger Bros, Don Mewmeister, Eliminator 86, Nebsky, Sky Harbor, Finley, Steampunk Center, Rafael Rodriguez, and Optimistic Avocado. You guys are the MVPs and everybody down there in the description. A big thank you to you guys as well. Sweet dreams, everybody.